Good morning again to everybody, and uh, or good evening, depending on where you're joining. I know we have some people uh, joining us from Europe, and I know that David himself is uh, uh, joining us from Europe. So uh, hopefully uh, we have a good call today and uh, uh, a good discussion and uh, you know uh, a good uh, round of interaction at the end of that. So uh, let me just quickly walk you through the agenda. Uh, by the way, uh, my, my name is Mahesh Singh. I'm the uh, Senior Vice President of Product at Digite, and I'll be your host today and uh, hopefully doing a reasonable job of uh, passing the microphone around to people as uh, we, uh, we get everyone a chance to speak and, and to ask questions and so forth. Um, just some initial housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you who are currently in listening mode, uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, you, you'll, you'll see some icons at the bottom left of your screen to be able to go into full screen mode. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of slideware that we'll present today. It is really a mostly interactive discussion, so uh, uh, you don't really have to worry too much about uh, the slides. Um, uh, we'll start off with some initial uh, opening remarks uh, and introductions and so forth, uh, after which uh, we will uh, pass the microphone to uh, David, uh, who can uh, give us all uh, a quick brief on uh, uh, you know the you know the adoption of Kanban metrics and the business value of Kanban metrics uh, in multiple situations, and then we will open it up to an interactive roundtable discussion uh, where uh, we are hoping that uh, all of you have uh, uh, some uh, good questions to ask of David and to uh, learn from uh, his experience as well as from the experience of other people who might be um, you know uh, speaking today and be able to understand how different people might be using uh, the um, uh, using different metrics that are that are uh, available within within Swift Kanban as well as uh, um, uh, as well as uh, yeah, in in general outside of Swift Kanban as well. Um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 format could be that we uh, you know David, if you could just uh, talk very briefly about uh, uh, the uh, the uh, use of uh, Kanban metrics. Uh, very short, uh, short, short uh, initial address. Uh, we can then immediately get on to uh, uh, question answers by our audience. And then once we are done with that discussion, um, uh, we can uh, have a, you know, an, a sort of open forum for Q&A if required. And then we wanted to present to you the uh, product roadmap for Swift Kanban at the end of uh, uh, the metrics discussion. And uh, again, you know, if there are question answers based on that, we would like to uh, take your input uh, there as well. So uh, just to give you a quick uh, overview of what the uh, session today is all about, uh, and before that, of course, uh, make some introductions. Uh, I guess all of you know David, and again, um, you know, as I sort of preface my remarks and introduction to David, David is well known and doesn't really need introduction, but uh, nevertheless, uh, just so everyone is on the same page, uh, he's well known as a thought leader and a pioneer in the field of Lean Kanban for software development and for managing effective software teams. Uh, he's been uh, in the industry for over 25 years with experience in uh, the software industry, starting with computer games in the early 1980s. Uh, he's led software teams delivering uh, you know, great productivity and quality using innovative uh, agile methods. As you all probably know, he's written two books, Agile Management for Software Engineering, Applying the Theory of Constraints for Business Results, and uh, more lately, Kanban, successful evolution change for your technology business. Um, David is, of course, uh, also founder of the Lean uh, Software and Systems Consortium, LSSC, uh, which is a not-for-profit not, not uh, dedicated to uh, promoting uh, greater professionalism and better economic outcomes in the software industry. Uh, he's also the uh, president and CEO of uh, DJ Anderson Associates, uh, which provides consulting, coaching, and training services to organizations that are adopting Kanban and Lean methods uh, for software development, DevOps and IT operations uh, besides other business functions, and he does this worldwide, of course. Um, and last but not the least, uh, uh, David, we are, we are very proud that David is an advisor to Digite and consults with us for overall product strategy, uh, especially in the area of Lean Kanban. Uh, besides David uh, and me, uh, we have a couple of other people on the call today uh, whom most of you uh, have already interacted with. Uh, Ram Subramaniam is uh, VP of Sales uh, for uh, the Americas and Europe, and uh, you know you've uh, probably interacted with him uh, more than on more than one occasion. And Nitin Ramrakhani, he's uh, Director of Product Management at Digite, and uh, he's uh, also the Swift Kanban product owner, and has also interacted closely with uh, uh, with all of you. Uh, so uh, with that, let me uh, start with the uh, uh, sort of objectives of the roundtable today, and I wanted to just sort of uh, quickly. Uh, 
provide an introduction to this this forum and format. Um, so first of all, I think we are very blessed to have us, you know, uh, first of all, many customers for Swift Kanban, but of those customers, uh, a number of them that are very, very uh, involved with us, very, uh, uh, and in, within those customers, uh, we have champions uh, who have uh, pioneered the adoption of Lean and Kanban in those organizations and have, uh, uh, you know, uh, been uh, our, our great supporters. Uh, so the group that is gathered here today represents some of those uh, very ardent supporters, but as, at the same time, very vocal critics. And it is thanks to them that we have, uh, you know, reached where we are today in our journey on Swift Kanban. So this is really uh, an initial set of uh, people who are, are probably some of the most involved people with us. Uh, we hope to continue these roundtables with uh, other customers and other groups as well. But uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and, and for, uh, for uh, you know, supporting us the way you have. Uh, the idea of the roundtable was really to provide our customers uh, the opportunity with uh, Lean Kanban thought leaders, um, such as David Anderson and perhaps in the future other, uh, other uh, speakers as well, uh, to fully exploit your implementation of Kanban for maximizing business value. Ultimately, your uh, efforts to implement uh, Kanban and Swift Kanban is really to support your overall business, not just the IT function. And we hope that these sessions will help you with, uh, with uh, uh, exactly that purpose. Uh, secondly, we wanted to provide uh, David and, and other thought leaders uh, whom we interact with uh, uh, sort of a direct uh, interaction with some of our key customers uh, in order to uh, you know, understand what are some of the areas of interest and, uh, and of concern uh, in these organizations that are implementing Kanban and specifically electronic Kanban tools. Uh, we've had uh, uh, in a number of discussions in the past, but this, this forum hopefully provides an even better and a, and a sort of a more a close opportunity for interaction where we can learn from your experience and David can uh, listen directly to your experience and understand uh, you know, what might be some of the challenges that we need to address uh, both in the tool as well as in just the overall body of knowledge around Kanban. Uh, also, we, we hope that this will uh, ultimately provide a forum for all of our customers, all of you, to learn from each other's experience. So hopefully what you hear today uh, will be uh, of use to you and a take, good takeaway for you to uh, you know, potentially try out in your own, in your own organizations. And finally, of course, uh, for us at uh, Digite and Swift Kanban, uh, it, this, you know, this really provides us a very rich insight to, uh, to your experience and to, uh, to uh, what uh, you know, David can talk to your experience in order for us to apply that for improvement of um, our product and our services and to serve the overall lean, agile community in a much more uh, meaningful manner. So hopefully uh, that is uh, uh, the uh, you know, objective that we, all, uh, that, that we all have agreement on and we can uh, you know, continue with. Um, today's theme in particular, uh, we have heard this, uh, you know, recurringly in this, our discussions with customers in other, in other groups and so forth, uh, and that is all about the use of Kanban metrics uh, in, in, a, in a variety of uh, functions. First of all, it is just the general understanding of the basic metrics. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion, uh, for example, on the difference between lead time and cycle time and which one should be used, uh, uh, using a use of control charts and things like that. Do we really need, do, does, does everybody need, really need to be an expert on uh, statistics, for example, to be able to understand these metrics? So uh, a lot of these questions come up uh, just in the basic use of uh, Swift Kanban metrics. I'm sorry, Kanban metrics. Um, uh, the second part of it is, of course, their effective use in IT and software situations. Uh, I would say that uh, a bulk of our customers today, at least, are uh, primarily in the area of software and IT, uh, uh, in application development and IT ops and so forth, uh, though we do have a few customers who are outside of the IT function. Um, so first of all, the effective use of uh, these metrics in IT, but also in the non-IT functions. And, and finally, uh, as our you know, champions uh, who are implementing Kanban and, and, and electronic tools like Swift Kanban, as they want to convey the value of these metrics to business, how do, how, what is the if sort of most effective way to communicate the value of these metrics to management and also apply these metrics to business overall, uh, not just to their own functions, so that um, uh, the ultimate value of Kanban is uh, realized by uh, these organizations that are implementing Kanban and, 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 Kanban and Swift Kanban in particular. So that sort of is the overall agenda for uh, the uh, for the discussion today. Uh, so David, I know you had a question about um, uh, you know whether you are going to speak today or not, and I and I did uh, uh, convey that earlier. But irrespective, I think 
you know, if you could just give a sort of introduction to this topic and, you know, uh, provide uh, any insight that you want to share initially about uh, how you want to, uh, how, um, you know, people are using Kanban metrics and how they can best be utilized in, in these different uh, scenarios that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that could be a good starting point to talk. And then, uh, you know, uh, based on the questions that come up from the audience, I'm sure uh, there will be, you know, opportunity for more discussion. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. You. Okay, so um, it's not clear to me, Mahesh, whether you want me to be only on the the uh, landline, or you also want me on the voice over IP. Uh, David, it looks like you do have to be on both, so I have uh, made it uh, made you available on both the lines. Okay. So you can let me know if that's causing any audio issues. Um, uh, good afternoon or evening. It's evening here in Stockholm. Uh, um, I'm wondering how I go about sharing some uh, PowerPoint slides, Mahesh. I, I need to uh, figure out how to share on WebEx. Oh, okay. So if you would like to do that, David, I can uh, certainly transfer this to you, and you can do that. Ah, uh, the sharing menu. But for some reason, it's not working. It's all grayed out. I, I'm, I'm just making you presenter, David, so you can go ahead and uh, okay. do that in a second. Uh, now it will let me do it, so... Um, Okay, so can you can you now see uh, some PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, good. Sorry about the technical issues here. I have a new laptop, and we didn't have WebEx installed on it until 15 minutes ago. So I'm just reusing some slides that I used here at the Agile Israel conference in 2010. And uh, many of the people on the call will have seen this picture before. Uh, it's a cumulative flow diagram from a project that, that I ran years ago. I use this uh, particular picture quite often. But what it demonstrates is how to read the cumulative flow diagram that uh, it demonstrates between the started and complete that we have the quantity of work in progress and that horizontally between started and complete, we have the average lead time. And most people know that uh, tools like uh, Swift Kanban provide this chart and they understand how to read it. Average lead time is uh, a useful metric if we're trying to predict what we can get done in the long term. It's not particularly useful if we're trying to predict how long an individual item will take. Um, but these uh, cumulative flow diagrams are informative because they help us understand our capability to supply and our demand. Um, this next one is from the very original uh, Kanban implementation at Microsoft. And this cumulative flow diagram actually shows the previous year before we introduced Kanban. And it, it simply so shows the change requests incoming in blue and then the completed ones in purple. So we can see from this chart that for about nine months of the year, their demand was exceeded by, uh, was exceeding their capability to supply and the blue area is getting larger and larger. So there's more uh, work in progress. And the length of time that the items are taking to complete is getting longer and longer. And what happened in this instance is the Microsoft management intervened and added additional staff to this team at the beginning of January. And we begin to see the benefit of that 
through uh, January 2004 to June 2004, where with additional capability, they were able to complete work faster and reduce the quantity of work in progress and, and hence reduce the lead times. So a diagram like this shows us both capability and demand, and uh, it, it tells a story over a period of time. Um, there's just a little detail that pops up here saying, you know, giving some specific numbers that the total WIP uh, had peaked at 144 change requests in progress. And at that point, the uh, lead times were so long that something was uh, done. And the, in this case, they had added a team in Hyderabad in India to help out as actually part of a handover strategy to move the work offshore from uh, Microsoft in Redmond, Washington to, uh, to Hyderabad. This following picture uh, shows the, 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 uh, the next two years. And what you see in July, remember in the previous picture, they had closed the gap. Well, here in July 2004, we now see the, uh, the, the incoming rate, the demand, and we also see their capability to supply. And what you'll notice is that during July, August, September, October, that gap begins to open up again. And the reason for this was that the, the handover to the team in Hyderabad was complete. And as a result, the, uh, the, the, the workforce was smaller again. So during the first six months of 2004, they had double the workforce. But in July, the uh, Americans went away and were left only with the team in Hyderabad. The result was that their capability was decreased. And the gap begins to open up until uh, November when we began to introduce the first ever Kanban system. And then you can see the results of that, that it very quickly narrows down the quantity of work. Actually, that's also showing their, their backlog uh, queue. So uh, during the period uh, December 2004 through to approximately June 2005, they still have uh, a backlog uh, as well as the work that's in the Kanban system. And you gradually see that shrink, and then it gets down to the point where uh, they're, they have a constant work in progress, which is just simply the work within their Kanban system. And the uh, the, the work is completed very predictably, and the demand and their capability are precisely matched. So over the two years, if I go back one slide, actually it's three years altogether displayed on these charts, uh, we can see visually uh, very significant improvements. Uh, and this was achieved by uh, controlling the work in progress and implementing a Kanban system and a, a, a sequence of four specific uh, improvements. So the, the cumulative flow diagram is very informative on these things. It tells us um, the demand, it shows the incoming rate, it shows quantity of work in progress, it shows our capability to supply uh, it will tell us whether these things are deviating. And equally, um, as the shape of the diagram changes, it, it shows us improvements. Uh, and we can use it to tell a story. And there's some pop-ups on this one um, which uh, highlight where specific changes were made uh, and certain things that were uh, achieved. And uh, here is the diagram for the, the entire three years. Th 
These uh, next two were supplied by a, a friend of mine who works at Constant Contact in Boston, uh, Mike Fitterman. And uh, you can see from this, um, this is for their website development in 2009, and there's a, another one here. Um, this one is for uh, January of 2010. And there is a really an improvement being demonstrated between November 2009 and, and, uh, December, and January 2010. Even though they're only two months apart, um, we can see that they're getting a significantly um, larger amount of work done and they're controlling the work in progress better. Um, these uh, charts are, are from before we were using Kanban system. And I started experimenting in 2003 with taking data that we were collecting and uh, putting that data into control charts and then trying to correlate the results from the control chart with what had happened in real life. And what I discovered from this experimentation was that the most valuable thing to track in a control chart was actually the quantity of work in progress. Uh, th this was a contributing factor to adopting Kanban systems later on. If we look at this chart, you'll see that there's a bulge in the work in progress around the end of February. And if we plot the quantity of work in progress into a control chart, then we actually notice that there's a correlation between uh, management intervention and uh, the, the system going out of control and then subsequently coming back into control because of that intervention. If, on the other hand, uh, we just simply look at plotting lead time in the control chart, uh, it was actually within uh, control the, the entire time this particular project was within control. Um, this second one is from the same team later in the same year, and they have some problem with the requirements you can see from the uh, blue area on the cumulative flow diagram, but their ability to build the software is fairly steady. But if you look very carefully, you'll notice that there's a, a bulge in the green area, and actually that their completion rate of work was way below where it needed to be, and it was much slower than uh, other areas. And work was being held up in testing um, for various reasons. The, the, code, the code reviews were failing, and code was having to be reworked, and things were having to be retested. Um, because of a particular individual on the team and the style of the development and style of object-oriented design that he was particularly interested in. And uh, this meant the team was really slowing down. If we plot the whip into the control chart, so if we're plotting total whip, uh, we actually see that uh, it's gone out of the control range for a while. And the point where it comes back down into control is actually the point where that particular individual took a three-week vacation uh, away from the team. And while he was gone, they got back on with the business of building software the, the way they felt comfortable. And they, uh, they speed up significantly. The quantity of work in progress is reduced dramatically. Uh, we can also see the, the data on the uh, control chart in the top right hand side with the lead time control chart demonstrating that lead times came down to an acceptable level um, uh, and that correlates with the uh, the, the same event. Uh, again the same chart here but this one looks specifically at the lead time for testing and uh, this is even more dramatic. So in this case, what we're doing is mapping the quantity of work in progress only from the green area on the cumulative flow diagram into the control chart. And this uh, very uh, dramatically 
correlates against the special cause event of the uh, chief, uh, the, the architect uh, taking a three-week vacation. And uh, we're also the, um, uh, in the top right, we have um, the design work in progress. And in the bottom left, we have the uh, uh, coding. So this is actually breaking the cumulative flow diagram whip into the brown area, the yellow area, and the green area. And the green area was the one that was the most informative. And that's what we would expect, because the green area uh, it represents testing, and testing and code review is where the, the problem was. Um, I'm going to switch presentations. If, um, just bear with me for a second. I want to show you a newer version of um, what's, what's coming up. Uh, David, I just take this opportunity to uh, uh, to let people know that in case they have questions on the slide that you're presenting, that uh, they could uh, ask the microphone and uh, perhaps you could take a channel two while you're uh, presenting as well. OK, so hopefully you can now see uh, the lead time distribution chart. Mahesh? Yes, I can see that. Right. So now we're looking at uh, lead time distributions, and these are from 2007. So the, the x-axis now is showing us the number of days it took to complete items, and the y-axis is simply the quantity. And these distributions are, are very informative because they give us insight that we can't get from a cumulative flow diagram. They show us the, uh, the, 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 uh, the shape of the distribution, and that allows us to understand things like not only the average, but also the tail on the curve. If we go to this next slide, the, um, this one is showing the data from April. So there was March and April in 2007. And the next one is breaking down that, that uh, April data. And what it's showing is that the average is 31 days. But if we look at the uh, first confidence interval above the mean, we get 44 days. And the second confidence interval is 51. So if somebody wanted an understanding of um, uh, the, how long does it take to complete a change request, we could say that uh, it takes 51 days or less for 98% of the distribution uh, observed historically. And uh, distributions are useful for understanding you know, sort of cumulative historical performance and providing a probability of how, how long something will take to complete. And this can be useful for uh, knowing when to start an individual item, particularly if it has a hard delivery date. Um, if, for example, we wanted to start uh, a change request that had to be delivered on the 1st of October, then this diagram would tell us that we need to start it at least 51 days prior to the 1st of October if we hope to deliver it on time. Um, and we'd have a reasonable confidence. We'd have 98% confidence, statistically speaking, that starting 51 days prior to the 1st of October would allow us to complete the work uh, on time without having to do any uh, special effort, just with normal working would be sufficient. If, on the other hand, we don't start it so early, then we would have to give it special attention if we were to, to have confidence that it would be completed on time. So lead time distribution is very informative, and um, it uh, helps us decide when to, to do things. The average, on the other hand, is more useful for making long-term plans. And if I flick through some slides here, 
if we're doing a major project, this uh, Kanban board for very big, um, greater than $10 million project that we did in 2007, it's a two-tiered board with large scale requirements shown in green and user stories shown in yellow. And in total, there were about um, uh, two and a half thousand user stories in this project. This is not the cumulative flow diagram for that one. I'll skip past it. But if we look here, the the work in progress and the average lead time we understand, and the slope on the completion is the average throughput or the average completion rate. And what we can see here visually is a graphical representation of what is known as Little's Law, which states that the average throughput equals the work in progress divided by the average lead time. And we can see this purely from visual inspection. Uh, so it, it's very clear that the equation makes sense. And an equation like this can be used to uh, plan for uh, long-term projects that um, typically we observe that over a, a longer project, the completion rate will follow an S-curve shape and we can model that S-curve shape uh, with a Z. We just simply divide the S into three regions, uh, a, a slower region at the beginning, a faster region in the middle, and a slower region at the end. And that faster region in the middle becomes our target velocity for the project. So uh, if we make a plan like this, then we can track the plan versus the actual and use that as a day-to-day -day management tool. I'll uh, skip past this bit. Um, so again here we see that uh, this specifically says during the middle 60%, we need to hit an average throughput of 220 features per month in this example. Uh, so that's not the average for the entire project. The entire project's actually only 100 features per month. If you notice, we have 2,400 features on the y-axis. Uh, actually, it's 2,200 if we look where the Z is going. So 2,200 over a 24-month period is uh, slightly less than 100 per month. But during that middle period, we actually have to achieve 220 per month if we're to be complete on time. So we need to staff this project in order to hit that velocity. And the way that we do this is we look at the average lead time from, from our historical observed capability and we work with the assumption that we're going to keep the development process the same. And therefore, we can expect average lead times to be typical of what they've been in the past. Meanwhile, we have a target average throughput, which we've uh, determined from our planning. And that will tell us how much work in progress we need. In other words, how many of those yellow sticky notes we need to have in the uh, on the Kanban board. And from that, we should be able to determine how many staff we need if we were to um, look again. Using the, the data that's in this, it actually turns out that we need 22 uh, yellow sticky notes. We might round that up to 25. And my suggestion there would be, why don't we create five small teams and we do five, uh, five uh, user stories per team uh, as a whip limit. Um, so if I go back to the original picture, what we would expect to see in the columns that say design, coding, and code and resolved, which is design, development, and testing, we would expect to find a total of 25 uh, yellow sticky notes. And if you were to count the ones in this photograph, you will realize that it's a smaller number. Uh, one explanation for that is that this photograph was taken very early in the project, and we weren't fully staffed. And actually, at that time, um, we, were, uh, we weren't anticipating uh, just quite so much work in progress. So there were some mistakes made on this particular project. 
that really to ensure that it was on time, we should see a total of 25 uh, user stories, the yellow sticky notes in those three columns, the design, code, and resolved column, spread across uh, the five lanes on the board. So uh, very basic metrics, the work in progress, the average lead time, the distribution of lead time can be used for both short-term and long-term planning and used to inform uh, how we organize a project and to make us very predictable. Um, and uh, control charts are potentially useful. I, I personally find that uh, putting the work in progress in a control chart was the most useful thing. But once you have a Kanban system and you're limiting work in progress, uh, then that ceases to be useful. Uh, the lead time data in the control chart uh, is, I think, most useful for ter telling historical stories, for demonstrating um, uh, visually uh, when you made process improvements and then observing whether uh, those changes did in fact in, uh, produce an improvement. So the lead time uh, control charts that tools like uh, Swift Kanban produce are probably most useful as report cards um, to demonstrate to managers and uh, external stakeholders uh, how well you're improving in terms of average lead time and the spread of variation and how predictable you're becoming. I think that's all I want to cover for now, Mahesh, so I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, switch off the sharing. Thank you, David. That was <coughs> fascinating <coughs> and a very interesting discussion uh, on the, uh, on the uh, uh, metrics. And I think, uh, you know, as we have seen in the past as well in the webinars that we've done, uh, uh, just great to hear you and to be able to, uh, you know, uh, to it from, listen to things from your perspective. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, open up the, uh, the session for people to be able to ask questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make I'm myself presenter here, here so that uh, uh, back slide that I was showing slide. earlier. Showing and uh, and uh, I just wanted to uh, provide a, a quick guide to people who may want to ask questions that uh, uh, if you can, uh, you know, when you ask your first question, if you have multiple questions, that is, if you ask uh, your you know, first question, uh, if you could uh, perhaps uh, give perhaps, a big uh, background about your uh, about your, uh, about your uh, company about and uh, also uh, 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 do a quick explanation of how uh, you're using Kanban or implementing Kanban and uh, if you wanted to say something specific about uh, about Swift Kanban then you can certainly do that as well. All right, so I see, uh, Melissa, you have a question here. Uh, let me go ahead and pass the microphone to you. So can you hear me? Yes, Melissa, we can hear you. Great. <clears throat> so I'm Melissa Scarfeo. I work for Encore Capital Group in San Diego, California. And uh, I'm a manager here in the software engineering department. And uh, we are just now um, transitioning to agile type of development. Um, and in some areas, they're working on Scrum. In my area, my projects are relatively small. And we thought a Kanban would be a better option. So um, as we purchased some licenses to the Swift Kanban software, and we've implemented it in just my domain. Um, and uh, so I've been using it for about a month, I guess. I don't have any experience with Kanban. So uh, forgive, forgive me if uh, some of my questions might be a little ignorant. But um, one of the things that I wanted to know specifically with respect to metrics is um, the process we're using here is <clears throat> when we add things to the backlog, I've got a project manager, pro pro program manager, she's called, that um, prioritizes everything in my backlog. Things that get towards the top, we size them with, um, we call them points, and um, it says days on the board, but they're really points. and um, I want to be able to measure, so I guess the capacity or the speed that, or 
I, I don't know what the right term is, but the velocity of how fast things move through the board. Um, and my secondarily, I want to know if I can, if there are any metrics that I can use to measure the effectiveness of individual members that are participating on my team. Mahesh, it's a very tool-specific question. Do you want to take it? Uh, so actually, I'm going to ask uh, Nitin to uh, speak about that as well. And uh, um, Melissa, I'm, I must apologize, but it was a bit of an echo at the uh, top of the uh, question. So uh, in case we need your help to repeat the question, please bear with us. Uh, Nitin, uh, are you able to respond? Correct. Yes. So right now, I, I download the cards based on card type. Um, I use the export function and um, on the cards that have gone all the way through the process. And I'm able to, in, to kind of interpret that. But I, I, I guess my issue is that when uh, the card is going through the board, it's passing through the different um, lanes, the vertical lanes that represent the different steps in my process of analysis and design and testing. And so it's actually changing hands. So different people are pulling the cards from this lane to that lane as it moves through. And so with respect to my staff and their effectiveness and how I could, po and maybe this isn't a, a good idea to try to do this, but I'm trying to measure the, of my staff members, you know, what kind of relative speed they have with respect to the work that's going through. So is programmer A getting more points through the board than programmer B, for example? Uh, yes, I, well, I think you did, I, uh, actually, since you're, if, if I could measure, I guess, since it's changing, changing hands, and my developers are really only participating in two lanes the, uh, to any great degree, m then I guess really I need to measure the, the velocity of that lane or maybe some of the metrics that David put up on the board that had um, 
I noticed, you know, he was focusing more on work in progress numbers um, per per each lane. Uh, that those might be um, helpful to me to try to look at things that way. Uh, I did want to ask if those, if any of the slides that he presented would be available um, to refer to later. I had a lot of nice formulas and things that were on the slides that I would like to play with. Right. So, So both of the presentations that I used there are publicly available. Um, one of them was from Agile Israel 2010, and if you Google for it, you will find it. You'll probably find the video of me presenting it. And the other one I've presented several times recently. Um, the easiest one to find would be the uh, um, the either the either the OOP compass. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm hearing a a lot of noise on the call, and I'm not sure if you can hear me. So on Melissa's side, Melissa, I think you probably have some colleagues of yours around you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of in an open area right now. So I'm I but I'm going to do Melissa's mute you while uh, David is talking so that David can uh, you know speak and then uh, I'll get you back on. Okay? That's perfectly fine. Thank you. David, go ahead. so yeah, so the the two presentations I, I used there, one was the Agile Israel Metrics presentation, um, which should be online if you Google for it. I'm not sure if it was videoed but the, the presentation certainly online. And the video from my Munich presentation for the Lean Kanban Central Europe is available. So the other presentation was from Lean Kanban Central Europe in Munich. And perhaps uh, Digitay could find the uh, URLs for those and then share them with everyone who attended the call. We can certainly do that. Thanks. 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 All right, uh, Melissa, hopefully uh, this answers it. So let me uh, go ahead and remind, pass on uh, to the next uh, person who has uh, a question. Uh, Melissa, did you have any uh, follow-up? Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, let me pass the call to uh, the mic to Shekhar Sina. Uh, Shekhar, uh, one second, you are, you're, on, you're on the microphone. Thank you, Mahesh, and, uh, and thank you, David, for sharing your insight. Uh, it was uh, uh, very useful to see the kind of metrics that you used. And, uh, 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 and we in Granger, I work for a company called Granger. I'm a manager here in the IT department. In fact, my director led a book review of your book, Kanban Successfully, Successful Evolutionary Change for Your Technology Business. Last year, following that, we did a POC. Uh, with Kanbanize.com and eventually we, uh, we bought licenses for Swift Kanban and we are implementing it here uh, for our technology bill. So we, uh, we are an industri industrial supplier, so we don't, we don't build the stuff that we sell, but we sell stuff to uh, businesses and institutions to keep their businesses uh, facilities up and running. Um, so uh, we do all the time. We are trying to improve the uh, um, software systems that we have uh, to improve the experience for our, our customers. And therefore, the part of the IT department that I work for, we are in responsible for the infrastructure. So let's say if, if it is a new SAP module that we have to implement, we have to build those servers, then we have to install that application, make it available for 
software developers and then building performance monitoring, tuning upgrades and so on and so forth. So that's that's our purpose of life here. And uh, our, our Kanban journey has been very useful. Um, we have seen improvements. Um, and uh, uh, however, and, and, uh, and we have found Kanban also to be very useful to, you know, in, this, in this journey. Now, what, what we what we think that this uh, product can become even better is, is uh, if we start seeing the kind of metrics that you showed us today, because you know, some of the metrics that you showed us was you know, how you have a control chart that depicted the uh, the, uh, the uh, 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 response time, so to speak, of development versus unit test and design, and and that's that's. In our value stream also, there are several teams involved. There's networking, there is storage, there is you know, server build, there is an application build, there is testing, and so on and so forth. So, and that end-to-end -end can take a lot of time. And so we do want to have the ability to monitor, uh, you know, using some of the graphics that you have shown of the individual teams involved. And then the individual teams would like to drill down and see how their individual contributors are doing. So I see a lot of value if you know these metrics that are being captured by the system because <laughs> every move has been time stamped. If we can you know if, if the software can provide us the ability to display it you know, in the form that you displayed just now, I mean it tells a great story. And uh, and if we can tell that story not only to the individual contributors but to management it would be to go a long way. So my question is when does Swift Digital are going to implement you know, some of these uh, uh, metrics and graphs that uh, they even just show. Okay. Uh, so, Shaker, uh, so, Shaker, uh, so uh, sometime back, uh, about maybe about a minute back, was the question I'm going to come to. So, Kanban, not so much to David. Uh, so, I just wanted to uh, mention that we do uh, have implementation of the control chart. Uh, it perhaps does not look exactly like the way that uh, David has showed. Um, again, uh, Nitin, since you've been um, involved in the, some of the discussions and uh, uh, Ram, so also you, so also you. So perhaps maybe you guys want to uh, take um, take uh, Shaker's question about uh, you know what we have today versus what they might be looking for. So uh, I think some of the stuff you guys already do. You have the ability to uh, filter the reporting by. Um, um, areas within the workflow so you can report cycle times through different functions. Um, I, I'm, I can't remember whether you're capable of reporting the um, amount of waiting time compared to engineering time. Yes, actually we do uh, report on um, the waiting time uh, versus the work time, which is the time. Um, and uh, I think all of that is available through filters that are available through the metric. Uh, yeah, so go ahead and, yeah, sorry. The, yeah, so from the question, actually I think you already do almost everything he's looking for. The one thing that I showed that you're probably not doing at the moment is the lead time distribution um, histogram. Oh, excellent. So that's in the latest version. Very good. So uh, to su you know, summarize the reply to the question, I believe that uh, Digite support everything you need. Shaker, perhaps we need to. I mean, Shaker, for a lean-wise, that is something, you know, probably is one thing that needs improvement is some of these lean, you know, lead time and cycle time metrics. Uh, you know, a, a lean wise representation is, uh, you know, that is something that we are working on and, and uh, hopefully we will get that uh, pretty quick. So right now what you provide is end to end that you write. Right, right what, exactly. you, what you provide is once you have started till the end, what is your cycle time, what is your work time, or what is your lead time. But, you know, if you, if you, if David, what he showed today was he had some control charts that showed, you know, what was the performance for, for development, what was the performance for unit test, and 
uh, and those were the individual teams, those were the individual columns on his uh, Kanban board. And right. that's right. what we are that's what we are looking for, that that we filter by those because then it will be very you know, because here we are trying to change the culture, you know, the way you do the work. And if we can have those kinds of metrics, you know, it will show that you know, something teams are doing better, something is like behind and uh, by the others. So, so that's why it's important to, to drill down further and then, you know, a team wants to drill down into its team members. So, so that's where the, there's a need for, uh, for uh, you know, kind of mining and just seeing uh, the metrics in a more granular way than, than at the overall end to end that, that right now the software provides. Yeah, so uh, it sounds to me like you guys are embracing the idea of the operations review and sharing data across the business unit that uh, ah, that's better um, at, so you've got multiple teams you want to share data get reports across those teams I think that's all very healthy and I really feel that that, that data sharing across teams and public reporting and transparency is vital to changing the culture. From my uh, real experience, as you do that more, you're correct that teams will demand more and more metrics and to drill down onto specific problems and to be able to see with data things that they believe to be happening or understand uh, anecdotally or experientially they want to see it with data. Uh, I believe that if you're really doing that properly, you're always going to exceed the capability of the software that you're using, and that you'll need to develop some internal capability to produce some of those specialist reports that you can't reasonably expect a vendor like Digitate to supply in the standard product. So. It, I would think you will need to have a capability to export the data and do some of your own analysis using uh, statistical packages or uh, spreadsheets. Uh, the, uh, with my own team, um, I had six departments, so we had uh, really quite a lot of metrics, uh, not just for the department, but for the typically seven projects running in our portfolio. And as a result, we actually had one member of staff whose job was dedicated to data mining our tracking system and producing reports uh, for the, the, the six department managers. That the standard metrics that were coming out of the tracking tool we were using um, weren't sufficient. Of course, that was very early. It was 2007. But even then, I, I believe that if you're really embracing the Kaizen culture and using you know, objective quantitative management and uh, interdepartment operations review, you will always create more demand for metrics than your tool vendor like Digite is capable of supplying as standard in the product. Nitin, could you talk about how to export data from the tool so that uh, customers can use it for their own data mining? Sure, sure. So in fact, you know, we, we provide uh, you know, uh, multiple options. One is uh, you know the entire card data that can be exported, uh, you know, with uh, you know, all the, all the lead time, cycle time metrics. Uh, apart from that, also we have uh, you know bunch of reports that we have uh, built in. Uh, that can be exported and that tracks uh, you know the entire movement data of each card. So using that uh, you know uh, data export and putting some you know pivot tables in Excel, uh, pretty much most of the you know lane wise and some of the average uh, things can be generated. So are you guys planning expand anything on your metrics or is that uh, is that your uh, suggestion for your customer that you download and let this find you. So my question is basically is there anything in the pipeline or it's pretty much 
Yeah. No, no, uh, yeah. So, so a lot of this is definitely in the pipeline, you know, as as we can process, uh, you know, it, and uh, probably we'll be sharing uh, you know, some of our roadmap size and and issues. But uh, you know, I mean, we are just sort of giving it as of now. The data it, itself is also available for you know doing any sort of uh, you know uh, manipulation and putting up charts. Uh, but our, apart from that, definitely a lot of standard metrics is already a part of it, and we are continuing to enhance uh, this. So with, with two questions, um, both uh, times we've mentioned the capability of the tool to filter the metrics by the, the, the row on the board, and I think that's uh, a very important feature to enable drill down. And, um, Nitin, is it possible to filter, I'm, sure, I'm fairly sure this is, but is it possible to filter by work item type? Yes, yes it is. Yeah, so that's also very important. It's um, it enables us to look at the lead times and the the throughput, the velocity for individual types. Uh, so you could have a board that's really quite complex in its design, and as a result, the um, uh, different types going through. Um, a larger board, perhaps because you've got a, more of a maintenance type of operation, lots of different work item types, you need to be able to provide uh, predictability on promises you're making for those individual types of work. And being able to filter the metrics means that you can process everything through the one Kanban system, the one board, the one visualization, but you can still get fine enough grained data um, to make uh, 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 predictable promises for specific work items. Right. 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 All right. Um, David, thank you so much for your questions. And, and I should mention, uh, David, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that Ram and Ram already uh, have helped uh, Shekhar there a lot. But uh, Granger has been actually uh, very extensively uh, able to use um, uh, data on downloads and exports that he has provided to them. And I'm sure we've learned a lot, uh, Shekhar, based on your usage of the, uh, the data. And I think the uh, question that you asked as to, you know, how do we uh, how do we expand the metrics capability of digital uh, or swift carbon? Uh, clearly, we uh, would like to get uh, you, know, uh, you know feedback not only from uh, uh, yourself but also if we can get some sort of uh, consolidation of that feedback. Uh, you know, that's really been our approach to adding feature to the product. So uh, we are on the lookout for getting similar uh, uh, feedback on metrics that are being used uh, sort of across the board so that we can continue to expand that. But uh, so, and again, uh, your, your feedback is very valuable there as well. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll wait for my turn. I have another question for David, but, but uh, you know, I'll wait for my turn. Okay, thanks, David. Let me go ahead and pass the microphone to Gary Perkovic. Uh, just go ahead and do that right here. Gary, go ahead. Gary, go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, uh, Gary Perkwitz, uh, work at AGK. We're a fairly uh, new user of uh, Swift Kanban, basically just the last couple of months. And we've been introducing uh, Kanban uh, boards uh, to various value streams in our organization, and we're working to expand that. Um, one of the things I've uh, recently done is I attended a PSP uh, training, uh, David, and looked at the, uh, the kinds of uh, metrics that come out of uh, that particular world. And then I was rereading Reinerson's uh, uh, product, principles of product development flow, and I was thinking about metrics, and in particular, he's got a section in the book where he describes metrics for flow-based product development, and he lists uh, seven different categories, cues, batch size, cadence, and utilization feedback, flexibility and flow. And my, my question was, uh, you know, sort of based on your own experience, what you're seeing sort of happening uh, in the wild, if you will, and what you see going on with 
vendors, uh, software vendors, uh, Kanban systems in particular, uh, is are these metrics that uh, Reiner describes for full based product development kind of the metrics that frame up what you think should be in these uh, Kanban systems? Uh, that is to say, do these metrics provide adequate coverage of what needs to be covered? And and if it if it and then I guess also a sense of priority if if, uh, if it doesn't provide too much coverage, there are some of those metrics that are more important than others. So you have the advantage that you have the book in front of you, and my copies on the other side of the planet. Yeah. Um, but then I have the advantage that I spent uh, three days with Don Reinertsen in San Diego last week. So um, it, it's uh, it, it's never a wise thing to uh, contradict Don. He's a pretty smart guy. Uh, so uh, Don's really been a, a, a significant inspiration for me over the years uh, on my views and metrics. I, I thought his earlier book, the uh, Managing the Design Factory, had some uh, very good advice on metrics, uh, some of which uh, I incorporated into my first book um, in, with my advice on metrics for agile management, that typically metrics should be vectors, that they, they should be multidimensional and that if you're reporting metrics, they, they should typically at least come in pairs where one is the, the, the forward part of the cycle, like your velocity, how quickly are we delivering, but the other, the other one of the pair, the other dimension of this vector should be something that measures the feedback loop. So for example, what's the defect rate? You don't want the velocity increasing if the defect rate is also rising. Right? You would like velocity to increase, but the defect rate to remain constant, or at least to go down, or even better, to go down. So Don's been a big influence, and of the things you listed there, they all made sense to me. I'm not sure that the wider Kanban uh, adopting community and the, the, the market that's adopting Kanban is ready for all of those things yet. Um, Don's operating at a level of sophistication that might be described as high maturity Kanban. So the, the question is where is the big leverage? And I know that from meeting with Don last week he repeated several times that he felt that the big leverage was in the cumulative flow diagram, that there's a tremendous amount of leverage in managing and controlling work in progress, and that cumulative flow diagrams are very rich in information um, in terms of uh, incoming rates and size of queues and completion rates as well as uh, you know, average lead time through the whole system and cycle time through uh, sections of the workflow. So there's a tremendous amount of information on cumulative flow diagrams, and I feel that um, uh, people in my position in the market really need to be doing more to educate the uh, user community on how to leverage the most value from from those metrics before we get into too many other ones. Um, if there's another big uh, leverage metric, I, I believe it's understanding um, whether items are blocking, how long they're blocking for, and whether we have any slack uh, capacity. Um, I, I'm Becoming of the opinion that the ideal situation is to run a Kanban system at the point where there's sufficient whip that most things are flowing or they're waiting for what might be described as common cause reasons, um, but the, the very little um, you know, external blocking and 
there's very little idle time, but there is a li there is some. If there's no idle time, if everyone working in the system is fully loaded and there's lots of work queuing for common cause reasons, then there's too much whip in the system, and the whip needs to be reduced. So trying to run the system at the point where it, you know, I've described this in various ways over the years, talking about it's inflicting just a little bit of pain where the pain is idleness, and that's being reported at stand-up meetings. Um, I think that that's important, so being able to see that, being able to have metrics that help us understand the question of do we have too much whip in our system or too little, the ideal amount is just enough to keep things flowing and invoke just a small amount of idle time to provoke conversations about improvements. And that also introduces a, a, an interesting uh, comparative metric, an interesting benchmarking metric, which is how much whip do you need before you get to that point where a smaller amount of whip to reach that uh, inflection point where you start to incur some idle time, that would imply a, a, a better, more flexible, more agile system. So I believe that with just a few metrics, we're beginning to get a handle on how we could do uh, comparative, you know, sort of organizational process performance uh, style comparison on how much um, let's call it liquidity, do we need in our system in order to keep it flowing, how much whip is required. And uh, from a business perspective, if we're able to put some quantification on cost of delay, then we begin to understand things like the carrying cost of the inventory, the, the work in progress. But clearly, if we need more work in progress, to create a liquid system where the work is flowing, that additional whip implies additional people, and just paying those additional people uh, shows that we're increasing the carrying cost. So uh, I'm hopeful that without introducing huge complexity with just a few metrics that most of the tools are actually capable of reporting already, uh, and certainly Swift Kanban uh, has reports that, that give us this information, that will turn out to be hugely valuable. So as far as I know, uh, you know, looking at these cumulative flow diagrams, from what I've been able to pick up either through recordings or talks or reports from the field, uh, there doesn't seem to be Well, I, I, I certainly have too many books in progress, Gary. Uh, but I, I am planning um, more publications this year. Uh, actually, a lot of the information required on CFDs is probably available. Uh, I feel that the number one reason people are not using them is with, with a Kanban system where you have a limit on the web, the CFD isn't particularly useful on a day-to-day -day basis, and therefore people are not using them for day-to-day -day management. Uh, and perhaps there's just simply not enough sophistication or maturity to consider using the metrics and data for long-term planning and forecasting. Uh, I think there's a lot of people doing Kanban to manage day-to-day -day work and raise awareness of impediments and keep items flowing, but their long-term planning and forecasting is still the legacy 
way of doing it. Whatever they were doing in the past, they're still doing that. And they're not using the metrics that the Kanban system's making available to them. And that is an issue that I'm addressing in my advanced Kanban book. But uh, I've stopped promising when that book is going to be ready. I, I plan on writing a significant chunk of it in the summer of this year. So realistically, we're talking about spring of 2013 for publication. But we do have some other things uh, planned earlier than that. I have a management book that we're planning for publication in spring of this year. Uh, we have a case study book that my company is working on, and we're hoping to uh, uh, publish that in the fall of this year. And um, th there may be some other things that we're capable of doing um, before the advanced Kanban book. But the, the sort of detail that I've presented in, um, in presentations like my uh, Munich presentation, that stuff uh, in, uh, as a book is unlikely to appear until 2013 at the earliest. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I think um, Melissa has a question, so Shaker, uh, let me check her before I come back to you, if you don't mind. Uh, Melissa, did you have a question? I wasn't sure whether that was uh, from earlier or not. Uh, yes, I did. Well, I did. Um, so, um, when I was looking at the presentation that uh, when David was presenting, um, there was a graph about uh, the lead time with the spikes and showing um, a mean and, you know, it had 51 days and 44 days. And I was trying to understand um, on the graph whether the um, – change requests change were, request you know, were they all relatively the same amount of effort to, in, order to, in order to, you know, make a, make say, a, you know, I would need 51 days in order to get this done. I would need to know how big it is, I guess. And so I was just trying to understand the graph, and it was up for a very short time. So I was hoping he could explain that a bit. And then I had a question about block time. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that's very counterintuitive that a lot of people really struggle with. Um, but there is uh, some evidence, and I'm trying to think who I was talking to just the other day, uh, and they were telling me about how they had been sizing requests into small, medium, and large, and then they correlated the small, medium, and large against the delivery, the lead time, and realized that there was actually no difference in lead time between a small and a medium. And that's a very counterintuitive, right? and it's very hard for people to understand how come things that we sized as medium are not taking any longer than things that we sized as small. Well, the, the, the secret to that is to look at the metric that compares the waiting time with the total lead time. And uh, my business partner here in Stockholm does that with their clients. And they were telling me that the average is 5%. So let me just repeat that. The average uh, of uh, engineering time versus waiting time as a percentage of the total lead time is 5%. So 95% of the time is waiting. And as a result of that, no, it's good. Yeah, just uh, leave it. As a result of that, the size of uh, an item is really irrelevant to the performance of the, the team and the organization. Um, I, I attended a lean product development conference about five years ago, and many speakers from different um, 
different sectors like aircraft manufacturing, medical equipment manufacturing, bicycle component manufacturing and so on. And they all reported that the engineering time versus lead time was typically 10%. Uh, so as a result of that, what we learn is that uh, most of the lead time and what mostly affects the velocity is actually waiting time, which brings me back to your earlier comment that you were interested in tracking uh, metrics on individual performance. I would strongly advise you not to do that. Um, I've mentioned that in two books and in several blog posts over the years. It, it is likely to destroy any form of collaborative working and it will seriously affect the relationship between the management and the, the workers. And in addition to that, it's largely irrelevant because the individual performance is having a very small effect on your system performance that the process you're using and the system you're operating, um, the degree of heterogeneity in your, your system, so how many different platforms you're supporting, how many different programming languages, how many specialists you have on your workforce, all those things will be affecting the waiting time and the, uh, the liquidity that's in the system, how much whip you need in order to keep things flowing. And that will have a much greater effect. And uh, the, the Edwards Deming advice on this is that 95% of the performance is how the system is designed and 5% is the individual contribution. And yet managers want to measure individual contribution uh, but it's not the big leverage point. The, the high leverage point is to understand the system you're running. So uh, looking at the overall system performance and making process improvements is a much larger leverage than trying to identify uh, individuals who are underperforming. Uh, much better to encourage collaborative working and hope that the the, the, the skill and knowledge of the better people on the team rubs off on the others and that the, the overall performance rises. So there's evidence to suggest that teams that use pair programming where they switch the programming pairs frequently, the result is that the very best programmers bring the other ones on the team up to their standard. So encouraging collaborative working is a much better way of improving uh, individual performance than trying to measure the individuals. So uh, the, trying to size items is not particularly valuable. Um, the, uh, I don't believe in stuff that involves opinion. And if I ask someone, how big do you think this is, they're expressing an opinion. What I believe is much more powerful is to observe what really happens and use data, you know, historically captured data from the tool and use that. So to answer your question, uh, there was no attempt to size the change requests. The data that I showed, the histogram I showed, there was no attempt to size those change requests. The business sim simply sent them in and we worked on them. And regardless of whether they were you know, small, medium, large, or complex or simple, that data was recorded on the histogram. And there were two types of work on the histogram. There were bug fixes and there were new functionality change requests. That's why the data was multimodal. Um, so I'll try to bring it up again while we're talking. Um, I just need to find the correct one that I have open here. David, let me make you present. David, let me make you present as well. Yeah, so, David, you have to share the slide again because I have to do it myself. Yes, it's fine. I'm, I'm doing it now. Okay. 
So, yeah, if we look at this data, you will see that at 15 days or less, there's a significant cluster, and that's actually the bug fixes. And then the data that goes from about 20, 26 days and, and above, that's change requests. And what I learned from this experiment was that um, mixing work item types on lead time distribution is not uh, a good idea, that um, you should stick to a single work item type uh, per distribution uh, to try and that, that should avoid the multimodal problem in the data. Um, but within that, there's really no attempt to size these things. And what we're really doing with Kanban, there's a chapter in the book on this topic. We're trying to, to change the mindset of how we're working into a service-oriented mindset that rather than make promises on individual items, we're offering a, a service-level agreement. We're making a different kind of contract with the customer. So if we're doing software maintenance, we might offer that change requests are processed in 44 days or less with an 85% due date performance. And that would be based on our historical observation. And if we can get agreement that that's acceptable with, with the business, with the customers, then we no longer need to size or estimate anything and the effort that we put into that sizing and estimating can now be applied to actually doing development work. Thank you. That, that was excellent.